So I guess it's now four o'clock, so it's time for us to start. Um, people will be joining in the next few minutes. Uh, but yeah, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar. I'm happy to see everyone who is joining us today. Um, yeah, today um, I'm going to be the host. My name is Anna, Anna Marchuk. I'm from Hive. I'm a practice lead for service design. And Hive is the innovation company who is um, yeah, supporting clients throughout the innovation process in being human-centric in um, all the aspects of their activities. And today our webinar is about uh, designing human-centric digital services. And um, it is a really special session because we have Bruno as our guest. And um, at first um, I would start, I would give you the introduction and then later on I will also welcome Bruno. So um, our plan for today, um, basically welcome, it's exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, then we will talk with Bruno, um, discuss the questions that we also announced. We'll talk about what human centricity mean, uh, what is his perspective on that? Um, how can people in different roles foster human centricity in these organizations, uh, if they're designers, if they're non-designers? So we will talk about all these perspectives. And finally, uh, we will also discuss how teams can be better prepared to develop uh, human-centric services. And um, afterwards, uh, we will also um, check the questions. We'll have a Q&A sessions and uh, we will uh, also read and include your questions. So um, yeah, we believe that human centricity has always been very, very important. Now its importance is growing um, even more because uh, yeah, in the creating the new normal, it is very important to create services and products that have um, in consideration the needs and uh, feelings of the people. That's why we also decided to discuss the topic today. And uh, before we get into the interview, I just wanted to uh, say a few things about the session logistics. So as you see now, I'm sharing the screen and we're using the video during the session in the interview with Bruno. Uh, we are going to use the video so you will see both of us talking. However, uh, the cameras and the microphones of the guests of you um, are switched off. So it's just simpler like this for the webinar. However, we really want to hear from you and we want to communicate with you. And for that, we're going to use the chat function. So please uh, make sure that you see where the chat is. We were already writing some things there. You might see it or no, but just find your chat. And if you have any uh, questions or comments about our discussion today, just please use the chat and um, share your questions and comments. Um, I will be moderating the Q&A session, so I will be reading the chat and uh, bringing it uh, in your questions to the discussion. And very important point, so of course here in the session it's Bruno and me, but we also have Isabel on board, who is from the Hive team. And in case you face any technical issues, if you, I don't know, for some reason cannot hear us or cannot see something, just please write a, a private message to Isabel. She's among the panelists, uh, so you can find her there and just write her a message in case you have any technical issues. So as the very first thing, um, soon we'll start with Bruno's introduction, but for now, so that we see that you are there and you're following, then just, uh, why don't you just use the chat and tell us where are you joining from and what is your current role? Um, so, for example, I would write uh, Munich service design practice lead. So that's what I would write in the chat. And we would love to also hear from you to get the feedback that you are there and we see that something is happening out there. And um, I would not actually make a longer introduction than that because we have a very interesting uh, talk ahead. So uh, I would just uh, introduce our guest, Bruno. And uh, well, actually I met Bruno for the first time a few years ago uh, at the service design jam when we both uh, participated. And luckily, uh, shortly afterwards, we also had the chance to do projects together. And since then, in the past few years, we did several projects together. And you know, for me, um, Bruno has always been like a very inspiring person and a very inspiring professional. And um, recently, you know, when I thought that at Hive we do these webinars as the platform to share knowledge, and I thought what a great idea would be to have a conversation with him to share this inspiration also with the community and share this knowledge. And uh, I was very happy when he agreed for uh, and supported this idea fully. 
um, because of course we both believe that uh, knowledge is there to be shared and uh, I'm really happy that Bruno um, agreed and supported this idea and now I would just uh, stop sharing my screen to uh, introduce Bruno in the session. Hi Bruno. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation and for uh, the very nice introduction. It's a pleasure for me to talk a little bit about my work experience. And I'm currently a service design lead and insight manager at BMW Group. What does that actually mean? Um, I work previous on a development of digital services defining what are the customer needs, what should we design for the services, help them through the diverse methodologies and data sources to understand better the customer, drive user centricity within the organization, as well as generate user insights that will be then consumed and further on worked upon on each designer for each customer touch point. So I'm not the one designing. People sometimes think I'm the one designing the cars. I don't do an exterior design. I'm not a product designer, <laughs> even though I've studied that. Uh, I'm also not the ones designing interfaces, although I've also had that previous role on other companies. So, um, but we're not here to talk about BMW. I do have to put a disclaimer on. These are all of my personal views on the subject. And it should be more of this conversation between you and I and everyone participating on, on, on this webinar and start a conversation. So also feel free after the webinar is also ended. If you didn't get your, your question answered, to reach out to us and talk to us, to continue that conversation. And everything that I will present, it's my personal view and take on things and not, um, and it's not the, um, it's not any view of my employee. It's not BMW and not BMW oriented. I might take a few examples now and then, but I won't be able to talk any uh, specific things about what we're doing and what we're developing, of course. But we, I think everybody's here also that to also hear about you and your experiences. And I know you have a lot of them. I guess to, to start with, uh, maybe just tell a bit about yourself because you have also quite an interesting story as the designer. So how you came to this idea of yeah, you became a designer, you value human centricity and um, introduce your story at first. Great. Um, some of you may know, I've seen a few people that I know, some people from Brazil. Uh, I'm ori originally from Brazil and design wasn't my first choice. I didn't want to be a designer. I went to study medicine and I had that idea that I really wanted to help people. I wanted to cure people. I wanted to be there of service. And I do feel until today that is an amazing profession. However, my creativity wasn't being used. I didn't like the classes and I didn't feel quite home there. That's when I found design and had a chance to study in a very good university where you graduate on product and graphic design. At that time, we didn't have any user experience school, design schools, no interaction design, was everything really starting off. And I had an amazing opportunities to work with big companies at that time to learn a little bit about, about my craft. And with a project with Microsoft, that's where I found my love of interface, of design, of technology, and how the technology meets the user. Uh, and that's how I started on, on, on my design career, let's say, on that, on that small, but yet at that time growing part of design. I came to Germany where I currently live to study here and uh, started my work career here in a design agency doing user interface and UX design. And it was great to start at a time and where things were still pretty new. It was pre iPhone era. So we didn't have any apps. It was an app first. It was a mobile first. So we're talking about really, really old school days. And I started with the automotive company. So designing really the first car connected to the internet. It's like amazing, how, how do we do that? What should we provide? Uh, how could those services look like? And I had a, uh, I, I feel now that at that time we were very customer focused and companies were developing for the person buying the car. At that time, they were always thinking about, great, I wanna analyze this customer. I want to know who is buying it. What should I do in order to improve sales or improve revenue, improve the service? 
And that has shifted ever since, where we're going towards a more user focus, which the users may be not be the person buying the product, maybe not, may, may not be the person buying the car or that insurance, but it's benefiting someone else that is also interacting with the system further on. Or also even as a human, people that might be, you're communicating with the users which are even outside of the car, which are outside of the constellation of services and touch points that you're designing for your service. And doing that, a lot of UI and UX design, a lot of companies would come to a design agency and ask, hey, can you show me a little bit about uh, I just need a, a small project. I just need some icons or I just need to change a little bit of interface. Yeah, sounds familiar. <laughs> and you analyze it and you're like, well, no, there's, there's an underlying problem. It's a user experience problem. So let's, let's go through it. Let's understand. And also the first thing we should ask is what about the user who is using this? So the first thing that I've got out of that experience is the designers, especially from design agencies, sometimes when facing a, a client, they don't have that openness to go ahead and ask, hey, what about the user? Can you give me that user data? And I think that is great for us to have that freedom to reach out for it, to understand a little bit better. And that's also when I started being um, a little bit more um, concerned about what I was designing, why I was designing that. The act of design itself is something that I always loved. However, a lot of other questions starting popping up, popping up on my head. So I've moved from that to another design agency in Munich, which is basically doing a lot of innovation work, similar to, to Hive, similar to IDEO, the big design agencies, however, they're very small, which I could learn a lot of the process and focus on design thinking and how to deliver new products um, to my customers. And what I saw that after a while was also that my impact as a designer was until a certain extent with my point of contact with the company. And I really wanted to dig deeper and deeper and understand and also prioritize why that product and not another product, mm -hmm. if you have different products within one organization and how design play a role in that. And that's when I moved to the UK, to Capital One, to work as a um, strategy designer and tackle that in my first in-house job. And I feel that throughout my entire work experience, I had different role names, service designer, strategy designer, interaction designer, if it's a lead or, or not, a senior or not. And what I've learned is also, it doesn't matter what my role is, but what I'm delivering, what my work is and doing what I love. And I could then actually, through that strategy design, I could help even within a company to work as an internal consultant and understand that we need to drive more human centricity. And the more that designers, they grow inside a company, being able to get a leadership position, getting a seat on the table together with the product team, together with business analysts, together with the tech people, you can start this conversation and drive it more. And I think that's what we're here to talk about. Right. And that shift came with a lot of problems for myself that I've realized, things I didn't done right. And I'm also here to talk about it, share a little bit as in the end, we are all humans. And I think that we can learn much more from those mistakes instead of just from, um, from things that went well, right? Absolutely. And that's also when I came to BMW which was also another big shift as there's a lot of complexity in the products that we design as there's also a very strong hardware component of purchasing a vehicle that is produced worldwide. There's um, a lot of um, quality insurance tests that the product needs to go through. There's a lot of time involved on that together with the software component for your digital services. So it adds a lot of complexity and you're also designing a product that is seen worldwide and used through different people from all different countries. And I think that it's really important to understand how the brand is seen in different countries and what your approach is to, uh, to designing that service. Right. And I think that, as you said, 
But uh, in the beginning, a lot of people, a lot of companies now are being wanting to be more human centered. And I've seen that focus shifting also as before they were very tech oriented mm -hmm. and just developing great. We have this new technology, let's implement it. But now they see it as an innovation uh, necessary to deliver better services for, for their customers or else they will be um, overrun by different startups. And that startup success story is coming from Silicon Valley, coming from small company, disrupting those traditional sectors that were otherwise um, in lead through those big companies. All of these companies were like, oh my God, things are shaking. We need to adapt to how we are working. And they turn on to big companies such as Google to learn what are Google design sprints or yeah. big design thinking uh, consultancies, and as well as working in more agile. And similar to my first experience when I saw companies coming to me and asking, oh, I just want new icons. I do see the same happening, which is companies coming and saying, well, I just need more, uh, pers I just need to work with personas because I need it for my user stories. I needed to work agile. So when I'm writing the user need as a user, I want to, in order to, they just want to fill in those blanks, but they're actually not understanding what the motivation, what the meaning is behind that. Right. And the focus on the tool itself doesn't, um, doesn't bring any benefit. So just because you're using personas doesn't mean you are uh, human centered. You mm -hmm. are designing for the user. Yeah, this is a very good point because actually there is, uh, it seems like it's true that many really want to do uh, human centric design and embrace it, which is definitely a positive thing. And that's why I think it's also really important to keep this conversation of defining the human centricity and have this differentiation between like, okay, the firstly there is the wish, but then what it actually really is and uh, attempts to work with the, with the personas or, or like getting in touch with the tools playing around. It's definitely a good intention and a good step. But talking about that, so how would you define human centricity and why it matters so much for, uh, for the companies and why it makes them better? For me, human, the human centricity is when we design services and I see products also as services, services for people, for the user, not only for the person buying it, but everyone that will have contact with it before and after you're using that service also. And the way that you build it inside the organization is that the decisions being taken on how do you prioritize certain features of a product or how do you prioritize one product instead of the other? What are you going to invest is taken based on customer information, which means you have a lot of data analytics to understand how they're already interacting with your system. You go and have qualitative research as well as quantitative research, understand their motivations, understand their needs, understand why, and see them as a complex human being that is taking different decisions. There's a lot of behavior economics also uh, input on that. So understand from the different perspectives through different methods, what is the best um, solution that the company should provide and use that in order to take those decisions. So it's a human-centered decision-making process and not just working on design deliverables, but in the end, we're not talking about what does the user actually want or would use. And I see a lot of tests um, in different companies that are done with high fidelity prototypes, but what about don't we go one step back and we test those concepts before, mm -hmm. before we spend the time of designing those screens? Let's go out and talk with them. Does that concept uh, is well received? So working with those hypotheses, going towards and design helping making those decisions within an organization and not just design helping them just be look better, look more pretty or have a, a little better app, but understand the entire customer journey and life cycle together with your brand. I think that you would have companies will have bigger impact. And I think they always are, they are realizing that if they don't do this, they are getting run over. They are losing a lot of their customers for smaller, smaller companies. Uh, they are coming in 
they are more nimble, they don't have that big structure to work with, and they can take decisions faster, as well as there is a certain, um, um, a certain type of people that would also go towards a startup and say, I'm, I'm also investing on this company. I have a share, I identify with the company. And if the company grows, I'm growing together with it. And it's okay. different from other old companies, bigger companies than you are just one person on a big, on a big pond. So understand that complexity and say, great, we need to, we need to work differently. So what, that's why you see a lot of big organizations buying design companies, design agencies should drive that human centricity, uh, especially uh, agencies specialize in service design or building also their own service design within their organization and creating new structures, creating new roles and testing that out. Testing out, why don't we build a designer ops on our organization to allow a better work structure for our designers, for them to achieve more and scale the design impact. Yeah, that really makes a lot of sense because I totally agree with you what you said that human centricity is something that goes throughout the whole process, throughout the whole this design and innovation. It's, it goes when you really conceptualize something, it goes from really understanding what and what are the needs, what, where you start from, what you want to create, but then when you have too many ideas, it helps you to prioritize, it helps you to test it. Actually really a lot about something that is really deeply rooted in the way how you approach innovating and designing. And it's so true also what you say about the startups that it's a little bit easier because um, yeah, maybe through the size, maybe through the kind of the types of the products or services that they create, it's just somehow they, they sometimes are um, somehow dealing better with this methodology. Um, on the other hand, in the corporations, there were also quite successful um, examples. And even though it seems really difficult, because when you say process and large organization, it was like, oh my God, how we are going to change it. That sounds like impossible because in organizations, you might feel just like a little part of it and depends on your role. We know like design roles are not in all the organizations that are so perceived as uh, influential. And so the point is that organizations realize that human centricity is important and they kind of want to create these human centric services. On the other hand, from the side of the teams, it seems like a huge challenge to really live within these organizations and create something and drive these processes and the mindset. So uh, how do you think the, the people who work in these organizations can deal with that and really um, make human centric services? Um. I feel that for the experience that I had, it's much more of a mindset and a culture shift than it is on building, just using the right tools and the right methods. And that shift, that push can either come top down or bottom up. If it comes top down, I have also experienced problems that might arise from that of of the C-level executives just pushing and saying, we're gonna be human center, we're gonna do this. We're going to hire that person, that company. However, how do we do that? There's much less talk about it. And from the other perspective, organically growing is something that it comes to a lot of companies, especially to me, very natural. As I said before, I was designing interfaces. Then I started asking a lot about the services itself. And that's why I shifted to go in-house and be able to push the conversation further and either dig deeper and deeper and deeper until now that I'm on a strategic level, helping them uh, design the services as well as prioritizing them. So if people are, companies are working on agile, working on those user stories, make sure that your user stories are defined. Who is that user that you're designing for? Understanding that, understand the user needs, and especially also why is that so important to the user? What is the user motivations? And from that, you have a problem statement that you're actually solving a user need, which is actually actionable. And the team will be, will be able to do that. You will encounter the first problems, which is how do I get customer data? How do I get customer insights? And that's when I say that it's organically improving as designers and managers, they will start asking, great, so we need methods to collect those. So how do I collect customer insights? 
I had an amazing luck of getting into BMW and working with uh, colleagues that has already collected those. So once I, I started in the company, we already had an amazing structure to understand our users. So it was about for me like, okay, great. I wanna work with them and work with them, grow to that department for data analytics, how the website is doing, how the app is doing. So there's already a structure. And if there isn't, it's something that a company should then um, build upon and add that data tracking that we're always talking about. We should track more data. We should add more machine learning. And, but we're not talking with the people developing those until it's further on, on the design um, development of a, of, of a digital service. Mm -hmm. so once you're doing the first concept, once you're already doing the first um, blueprint, add those people to the conversation. And what I've done for a lot of years now already is adding always a data swim lane to service blueprints. And I've tested it with different companies and it's great. So the people owning that, um, owning that work, they see themselves reflected in the service and you're already building better service from the scratch on in order to drive the right metrics and understand what you're going for. And not just great Google use the heart metrics, let's use it for our service. Yeah. But then choose wisely what you're going to use. Because if you're developing um, services for insurance, as I said before, you don't want to do the engagement. That won't be a major metric, as people don't engage that often with your product, right? They just buy it and then just forget it maybe for years or decades. So understand how it goes. And I feel that for me, always to have that user in mind, these can be small steps and big steps for each company. One of them that I've learned in Capital One with my former boss, Aileen Beck, was she was always asking, what about a customer? Sometimes I would ask, so how was that meeting? She's like, well, I was there and I, we just have to raise our hands as designer and ask, what about a customer? What is the customer motivation? How are we driving this? And this not only designers can do that, also product owners, product managers, developers. If you're getting, um, uh, if you're working on a new feature, ask what is the customer motivation? What, what is the job to be done? And are we delivering what the customer is seeking for? And towards the more bigger changes, I always split them into different buckets. And they are, I guess, fine. It's uh, people, mm -hmm. faces and environment, tools, processes, and the culture. Okay. And some of this, what I, what, I, what I mean by that is that you see that they are all a little bit interlinked. Asking about the customer, you're going to see that a lot of also in culture. How do we create a culture that we're building towards a customer centricity company? But let's start with people. So for me, it's always about who is designing those services? Who's your team? And I've seen design agencies where the owners are designers and they tend to hire people from the same university. You end up having just a one type of team with the same mindset and the same background. And what I always do is how can we build better teams? How can we have more women on leadership representations as in Capital One UK, it's amazing to see amazing strong women on that role performing extremely well. I've got really lucky with that, as well as the recruitment team, which I was helping um, to recruit our design team on how to create that diversity, how do we push for it? And it was truly amazing to work with that, especially nowadays when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, right? And all of these movements. Does your company, does your team reflect that diversity. And I think that a lot of uh, quality of the input comes from having that diverse team. And I know that also at Hive, you have a lot of different nationalities and a very eclectic team, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can really relate to having diverse team, how much it is important for this really creative environment where people can strive and they can create really meaningful things together. And at Hive, we're really lucky that we do have quite um, a good diversity, especially in the sense of, uh, of backgrounds and nationalities and when people are coming from. And moving from that team is how many people, how many designers have a leadership position? 
and how does that transition mm -hmm. happen? As a lot of times we don't study that in university. And Leticia Pires, who's on the talk, she's an amazing designer, friend of mine from Brazil, a lead designer. And if you do speak Portuguese, go search her, mm -hmm. Leticia Pires, on YouTube. You're going to see a lot of videos of her in conference advocating exactly for that to stop this. Um, this sudden change on design to the leadership team without a certain structure, without learning. There's a lot of things that we fall back on. It's like, oh my God, I won't be designing anymore. What's the problem? Or you don't know the tools. You don't know how to manage people. You don't know how to manage a team. And yeah. especially you need to speak a different language. And this is something that when I heard her talking about that subject, it resonated with me to understand that, oh my gosh, I have an other set of stakeholders I need to communicate to. And this was also one of my mistakes that I've done when I moved in-house for the first time was I needed it first to understand that, understand the complexity and speak business to be able to drive that centricity and not just stay with your design team as they are all designers and it feels more comfortable. That's your, um, your comfort blanket, right? So let's leave it out and understand who are your stakeholders and take the leadership also as a design challenge. Mm -hmm. Building the design team and leading is also as a design team. And speaking specifically to this C-level as show them, do they understand design? Does your boss understand what design is? Explain to them the service design and how to make um, decisions with the user in mind. As well as they also wanna know why should I invest on this? So take them through the design process and show that design is there also to collaborate within this big organization. And you would have to reach out to other departments and break those company silos. A lot of products reflect the company structure, which is pretty interesting because no customer experiences that. The customers will jump to your website, to, to, your, to your phone, and they will navigate through different media. They will maybe give a call, stop by the shop, or to talk to a representative. And I think that's the beauty of it. We have the power of visualizing the entire story and kind of knitting it, that it makes sense as an entire complete role. So go to those people on those different silos. And I always use this as a, as a little metaphor. Unfortunately, not many will, will understand it, which is not the goal of a metaphor. But um, as I'm part of the LGBT community, very proud. What we have, what we call allies. Allies are people that they are not gay, lesbians, bisexual. They are just heterosexual people, but they are friends. They are they fight for the cause. They amplify your voices. Mm -hmm. This is also what we've seen a lot of right now. What the Black Lives Matter movement is also a lot of white people advocating for them and helping because it's our issue, it's not just their issue. And understanding that we can use now, uh, we can use now this, um, our, our voices within the company as a design, as a design team. However, we have a certain barrier. And uh, also from my previous boss, like Bruno, go find your allies. And that's what I realized that they are extremely important, not just have design allies, but look for those people that are on other departments, either tech allies or on the product team, people that are open about design, that they wanna be more user-centered and take them by the hands, work together with them. Right. Align with them on the same goals. And in the end of the day, we all want the same thing, which is to deliver a great product for our customers to enjoy and use. So, creating those links will strengthen and will also amplify a voice of turning that company into a more user-centered culture. Right. Great. So it's all about, uh, sorry, it's all about like then hiring the mixed teams, then having designers who also see themselves as the leaders and they go out of the comfort zone to have a seat at the table, go for leadership positions and, and have this knowledge and what would help them and what also designers could start from or designers or also people in other roles who believe in the cause of like human centricity and these approaches um, they should look for allies and supporters in the organization because it would really help them to have their voice heard and these allies could come from all the different departments across the organization so this is what this kind of work across the organization it really matters to help you 
get better and get your vo voice heard sooner. Exactly. And think about also how are you recruiting your team? Where are you putting those ads? Mm -hmm. Where are you drawing it from? And this is something that I have the chance of doing that at Capital One in BMW where we say we want to we wanna have the best uh, talent. And that's what we strive for. It doesn't matter where. Even when also Brexit happened, uh, the company was like, no, great. We're going get, to get great team. And just um, ask yourself also always these questions, as you mentioned. And once you have your team, one thing that I have seen is the second uh, big part of work is on the space and environment. Yes. So create, first of all, a space, a mental space for yourself. I haven't done that. Uh, it was hit the ground running. There was a lot of, as I said, work as a part of a leadership team that I had to do, new stakeholders, managing also designers, the entire team, you need to think about it and you need to have space for yourself or else you're stretching yourself too thin. Mm -hmm. So is it the right time for taking that step, for taking the decisions and do you have everything you need to succeed on that? If not, what is actually you need? Because you might not always get the perfect setup. So understand what you can live without, what you can um, open yourself. Mm -hmm. And also create a physical space for design. A lot of companies, they won't have boards, they won't have any wall spaces, they won't let you glue stuff on the wall because it will interfere with the architecture of the building. It's an amazing building. Or with a lot of external stakeholders coming in to, 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 to walk through the halls, they don't want to just see a lot of design hanging, hanging on. So understand that design needs that physical space to have talks, to have um, a design feedback session where designers put their work up there. They show on screens, on prototypes, and we test and we go through that. And create that culture, create that space for design. I'm talking even about ordering um, Sharpies and Post-its as some other departments won't use that type of tools. And always ask yourself, can I craft then time for myself to think about, to understand and tackle my new design position as a design problem and have that space of mind for myself, as well as do I have a physical space in my company where design can flourish? Yeah, it's really about the both. It's about the uh, mental space as well as the physical space because it helps one another when you have really great physical space with all the objects that you can play around and get creative it also yeah helps and contributes to your attitudes and um yeah the mood how you are in your work as well yes i had the amazing pleasure to work with uh one of my best friends in capital one juleni agire bielchowski and that mental space was something also where we're like, do you have time for, to grab a coffee and talk about each other's work and what do you think of this and challenge each other? And those times were golden. Now I miss it not being able to do that. <laughs> not with her at least. And um, that doesn't mean you have to do it by yourself, but yeah, these are very, very good. And understanding great, you have now an amazing, uh, if you have then the space or you're still setting that up, what you need to do is also have access to tools. As I said, Sharpies, Post-its, but also what software are you gonna use? Are you gonna use, um, are we doing Envision prototypes? Are we designing stuff on Sketch? Uh, or are we doing Figma? How can you actually you choose the right tools to do the right job for the right, um, for the right type of designer and inside your organization? So some design tools will be amazing of crafting a design library and also testing on a high fidelity prototype. However, you can design stuff on PowerPoint and test in low fidelity. And I have done that as I had no access to computer first week. Oh my God, there's, there's some stuff that I can do. It's like, why not? Just grab it and let's test it. And understand that we can work through those different levels of fidelity in order to test your concepts you're in, in terms of digital services, right? At BMW, we have a car. There is a moment in time where you have to be in the car and experience it that we cannot take away. You cannot just test it independently. And that brings a lot of uh, different uh, logistic problems of how do you do that. Uh, but we have already a great structure to do that. So it's understanding when is that bridge. If you're designing a product that has a very a big hardware component, when, when, is, when are those tests that you need to do that really 
are necessary the hardware and when are those tasks that you're just testing the concept and the customer need itself and aligning on those new tools and allowing designers to test them also helps you to scale design within their organization yeah and I think like about the tools, what I like that you mentioned that, uh, of course, they're in Vision and Figma and it definitely seems like, okay, that's like this, this UX guys are doing it or people who know how to use the tools. And then uh, what I really like what you're saying is that sometimes even just as simple as the PowerPoint is okay. It's like, it's totally fine. And I like that now um, people, more and more people start using whatever they have to create. And of course, Eventually, they might use different diversity of the tools because even professional tools, they get simpler to use and much more accessible. So I think it, is, it really matters for democratizing design from both sides. Designers getting more into the leadership positions, designers being heard, but also non-designers being able to play around with the design tools and also contribute to that and use that to communicate their work and show that. So I really like that um, that that is also on the tool side it is represented. Exactly, it's great, it's great to, and I think the most important, what we have to ask ourselves is, am I using the, the tools, are my tools accessible for everyone in this entire organization? Right. So they don't need to build a prototype, they don't need to have access to the raw file, but maybe they have access to the prototype and they go on Envision and they can comment right straight on it. Right. Or we can use this Maply to create an amazing user journey or personas and export it as an Excel sheet or a PowerPoint. And this is what Mark Sigdorn has done with that tool and realizing that, yeah, it needs to be more accessible to other, to other people. And alone, Maply being a web tool, which is pretty easy to use. And it's as easy as Trello. I was so happy with that because <laughs> I can just invite other people who just can collaborate and can contribute to creating these journeys without any effort. So that kind of tools is, are definitely helpful then. Yeah, and then you can see that they did it a very human-centered <laughs> way to design the tool. Do that. <laughs> and also think about it, is, is this worth the investment? Whatever, whatever tool I'm using, right? And yes, if you start scaling in for your entire organization, it's, it's gonna be better to, to manage and bridge that costs. Right. So what about the processes then? So we said about the, um, the people, we spoke about the space, the tools. We have still processes and culture. So process for me was something that you always, that is something that you learn in design university. That is each design um, agency also kind of preaches their own process. Mm -hmm. And they might take the design thinking and do five steps or seven steps and so on and adapt it in certain ways. And I think that it's important to choose the right process to your company. When I move from Capital One to BMW, it's not, okay, can you use the right, the same process? Because before I had an entirely digital product and now there's a hardware component to it. So the process needs to be adapted. And understand that you can craft based on a very abstract, a double diamond, what the best process for your company would be. And Specifically at BMW, I was lucky to be on the right place at the right time and doing the job that I love and I know what, how, to, how to do, that I was invited to create and design a process for the company. Mm -hmm. That means we're ISO certified and having to go through all of that. And this is part of what I mentioned before from Leticia of speaking business. Suddenly, I just got this task of myself to document a process never done that, don't know how that works. And I'm faced with this complex Excel sheet and this is gonna be certified, it has quality insurance, we need to deliver the best, we won't accept less. And being able to document all of those steps, what are the outcomes, who is involved, dependencies, risks, is something that I had to learn on the go and was an, um, an amazing experience. So making sure that when you're building a process for your company, in this case, having it certifying serves also as a leverage to be able to ask for budget, support from other departments, push on timelines and align on deliveries, as well as to establish new ways of working with that process and make sure the design is part of it and speaking the business language in order to push for those services. And start small this is what i would 
suggest. This is some things that I have done. I've already encountered projects where I wanted to start really big that didn't happen. You waste a lot of energy on trying to set something up that didn't work pretty well. So go light on it and make sure that the things will flow uh, much better. And with the results you get from those small projects, you show the return on investment on design and you can get more projects, bigger projects, budgets, and the right, um, the right process. So in the beginning, you might not have access to all the information you need. That's not a problem. Just do the project, but highlight those limitations. How light, how that is gonna impact the quality of the design, or if, if you're gonna get a biased answer from your customers or not, and if you can take decisions based on there or not. So I think that understanding and establishing step-by-step -step helps. And all of that together will help you to create a better customer-oriented or human-oriented culture within an organization. Remember always to ask, okay, um, raise your hand and ask, what is the customer? What about the customer? What is the customer motivation? And this go from small changes all the way into big changes. And this is something that I had the pleasure to work, work with an amazing designer called Lola Oyelayo. Oyelayo, yeah, I think I, I spoke it right. Um, she's gonna kill me if I didn't. No, she won't, she's, she's adorable. Um, and she, she taught me this. Um, she's currently at Shopify and she taught me this that sometimes the companies, they are not on the process level you, you wanna be. They're not on the culture. They don't, you don't have the knowledge of design and design is not working perfectly. And you shouldn't be measuring yourself to this amazing standard that we see a lot of companies posting online, right? What you need to see is what is your work? Your work is to get that company to a better stage and to move it further on. Mm -hmm. And you cannot just skip stages. And that's when she told me like, this is what you're measure upon. And don't compare yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be this kind of perfectionist. And you strive there. This is a big jump for the company and it will go slowly by slowly. It won't change overnight. And that's fine with that. So get visibility for design. How do, you, how do you talk about design? How do you show your projects? And every time that I show my project, I come out of that presentation within the company with at least five other contacts actively writing me. I wanna do the same. I wanna work with you. Can you give me some help? Or can I use the same structure? And then you can think about scaling design within an organization. Once you've delivered those little projects, and get those increments little by little. And it's great, uh, the re a report called um, the Design Maturity Report, I think it's called Design Frontier from Envision. Uh, I recommend everyone to go Google it and download that report. And it shows five steps of design within organizations. Going from that little anecdote I said about design just being a producer of making things pretty, all the way into design being part of the organization on leadership level and taking decisions. And it's, it's a big jump if you go from one until five. So understand where are you on that journey? Where is your company? What are the steps that you wanna take on those? If you have a big company, it doesn't make sense that you start right away a design ops team with 10 people. Let's start slowly. Let's show the return on investment. Let's see what is working and how we can grow it and test run some projects on it. And I think that what I would, uh, what I would suggest based on of my experience. Yeah, I, I totally see, uh, see the value of this approach. And I think it's also um, from your experience, it's working in organizations, but I could say um, also quite relevant things from the agency perspective, because the thing when you start, for example, working with a new client and you see that you could create really, you have like a, your project partner from, from your client and together you definitely see the value of working together and uh, the client sees you as the partner for innovation and have, applying this new um, approaches to creating things. And um, from, from the agency perspective in this situation, so this person might be also trying out to bring something in the organization and maybe stage one or two of design maturity. And then I think it's also even from the agency, it's important to keep it in mind and also have this start small approach that I really, really like. Um, from my experience, lots of really good long-term 
partnership, several that we have here at Hive, they started with a very small project. They started with one workshop or they started, let's, let's discuss the problem. Let's have a workshop. Let's see what is out there. Frame the problem, develop slowly towards opportunities, then maybe go test the ideas with the customers, just get a feeling of how it is, how it feels to get the feedback on your ideas. And then the team maybe would go back to organization and show again the results and get a bit more support for a bit bigger project. And I really see that this approach worked quite well also in that context when, um, yeah, when the people from organizations, they also seek partnership and working together with the, with the external partners. Let's yes. say. And also push for them, those organizations of having the human centricity part part of their DNA, part of their company mission. And I have seen that go to Capital One UK website. I know I've repeated a lot of times, but it's a great experience and a great example to go ahead and look at their mission statement that they do want to help customers with credit. And what they tell on their website is exactly, I think it's also on a career website, mm -hmm. it's exactly how you live there. So once you start in a company, you're going to talk about the customers, you're going to get design um, training and it's printed on the walls we we're always talking about it so once you get it imprinted on the DNA the mission and the goal of the company everyone is working towards that goal and that will help and then they will reach out to innovation companies for people to support them on that process and start that either if they're building their own internal team or external companies Right. So actually what, what we said that the processes sometimes are challenging to establish. It's challenging to really uh, have the voice heard on the other hand from the company perspective when we look not bottom up what each individual in the company can do, but also maybe when, what organizations can do starting from their mission, from the attitude they have to their police, what they communicate. It really starts from like the hiring process and from onboarding process, then you really start creating the teams. We kind of make a circle and we go like again from the culture to the people again. So hire the right people, shape your team, and then actually uh, onboard your team, no matter whom you hire for the company, uh, be it an engineer or designer or um, marketing specialist or so, like then you basically onboard these people with the right mindset right away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay. So um, I see that now we have a few minutes left of our webinar. Um, do our guests have any questions? So please, if you have any, then just use the chat to, to share them. I see that now just uh, Marluz wanted to know the name of the Brazilian design lead. So just, I just, she commented before. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Maybe uh, you can add your, your uh, Twitter tag there. <laughs> So um, I just probably would have a question to you um, based on the on the discussion. So maybe just to wrap up, you named these factors that I think are extremely important about um, having the right people, having the right space, space, mental and physical space, having the right tools and um, having the right processes and the right culture. So these five factors are really incredibly important and um, teams could keep them in mind when they strive to uh, be more human centric and foster human centricity in their companies. And, uh, but I think still was really interesting point about this very first uh, project uh, in different design stages. So in which design stages exactly you worked in your experience when the design stages, I mean like maturity of design in your companies. So in which stages for you, you, have, you worked and how was that experience? I've worked from um, early early definition of a concept of a problem area in order to define how we're going to innovate, how can that company innovate really using design thinking in a very an abstract approach and talking about relationships, motivations, and mental models all the way into how, how does that product look like? So interface wise, uh, I've designed uh, for car companies in Germany some long time ago. So literally saying, how is the visual representation metaphor? So when I turn this feature on, I turn this feature off, how do we visualize it? What are the controls that we wanna, we wanna have? And what I thought it was great on all of those is part of it, um, part of it is 
having that already done design concept tested as well as the early concept. It's okay. going out with people and inviting them. Different companies, have different cultures have different ways of testing, right? Uh, some are more nimble. I've, I've, had, I've worked with companies where every second week we had five uh, users coming in and we're testing and we would book the slots for those tests every week and say, great, in two weeks we're gonna test this, in two weeks we're gonna test that. And you iterate very agile on two week sprints together with the developers. That is amazing. However, other we cannot do that in other companies. And as well as maybe you're just creating one product that is gonna be used in different markets, which is my case right now. So aligning the type of testings, it's also a lot of problems that you can have. Mm -hmm. See, there is a question from Gabi. You mentioned personas don't mean you're working human-centered, but to me, I go to the step and um, change perspective with personas user stories. Could you explain? Um, I think that it's great that you're using personas and you're using user stories to change people's perspective. What I mean by that is that just because you're, you use Jira doesn't mean you're working agile. It's understanding that it's a tool. If you're not using the personas on the right way to make decisions, if they're just there just to illustrate a little bit and then the design team is just gonna forget that, the product managers, the product owners are not gonna look at it. It's just something pretty to go and check a box and say, oh, we have user personas, we are user-centered. Um, that doesn't have any impact on the goal of the company. Yeah. And I have seen people doing that. And, I've also seen that sometimes I realize, oh, well, for that product, we should work with behavioral archetypes. And a lot of people are like, but what is that? No, we're gonna work with personas. Like, great. I do the behavior archetypes, I show them, and I explain why, and they realize the benefit of using something different that will help them make better decisions, for example. Um, another maybe final question that I would have to you, it's about the very first project, so very, uh, practically, so when teams create uh, the small initiative that they want to do, and then um, they of course want to show it in the company, make it visible. So uh, who should be the stakeholders they should talk to? Maybe you could think of like the roles or where to start looking for those allies and what to, how to organize the visibility of this first initiative to get support. That's great. I think that um, even though you might not have service designers or strategy designers in your organization as a title, there are people doing already there for your organization or pushing for it. So go after those people. And I always start on my department or the people involved and they end up inviting other people for those presentations. So it can either be a brown bag section, session when you explain your process that you've been through, some people will be more interested on the content and other on the process. And I would make that two different types of presentations or else one of the other will be bored and will think you have wasted their time. So one of them is great. If you're interested in this topic, I will talk about the content, but if you're interested in also working more user-centered, these is, I will talk about the methodology and I will help you, I will give you access to tools and show you how your process, how our process was and how your process could be. So make those two different types of presentations mm -hmm. and just start small also with the presentations. On the first project that, I, that I've done on my current company, the first presentation was small, but from that there were invitations of, oh, can you give that to my entire department? Because only one person was there. And I think that that is the beauty of it. You just start having the ripple effect of design within an organization to get that quality and to have that impact. Yeah. I know that in your organization, you also have like more formal presentations or you also organize this kind of brown bag sessions or when like different people are invited to have lunch together and then the others are presenting what they have done. And it's also a nice informal setting that also attracts people to get together and find this common mind of people. We have um, one question here from Anne. Um, thanks a lot for these great insights. Thanks, Anne. We're happy you, you liked it. Uh, can you share some thoughts on the ch uh, challenge between creating global products that are also appealing to local needs? And can you share some additional resources, books, best practices, articles, 
that are helpful in particular for design of human-centered product service bundles. So question is on one hand, this challenge between creating global products that also appeal to local needs. And the second is about the recommendation. Great, the recommendation I can start. There is a post, Francesca Terzi, she posted, um, I'll figure it out and I'll share with you guys and also uh, I'll give it later. I think that there's a lot of tool, amazing tools such as Envision. They have an amazing blog and I always go and read it. There's a lot of different podcasts and um, it will be hard to manage people's expectations on this webinar as uh, you have it in, well, I do it in Portuguese, um, <laughs> English and German. So. <laughs> That would be a little bit for everyone. Uh, I think that we can send it after in an email with some inspirational uh, links. I think that would be really cool for the in the follow up email. We will include some uh, top uh, advice from Bruno on the tools and books and articles and podcasts and so on. So thanks, Anna, for the idea. We will include it in our follow up email. You will get it. I, I will probably go and just copy those links from from Francesca. I'll ask her for permission. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so on the challenge between creating global products that also are appealing to local needs. I think that for that, what you need to do to understand is that global products will have different ways of the people interacting with them. If you're talking about cars, like the main difference that we all know is that drivers sit on the different sides, right? So like you have to adapt all of your service to that. That's, that's the main goal, right? You cannot just expect everyone in the UK to change how they drive just for your product. So understand them to, um, to see how your product's been used. So go to every country, talk to the people, see them, design or these challenges, these problems needs to be solved. You need to look that inside its context. Just don't do it independently. And also create user testings. Try to create the structure to test concepts. You can do it digitally. Um, Hive has some great tools to use that. And you can also test it on quantitative research as well as qualitative testings and make sure that you have straight contact with your customers or people you want to have as customers to all of those different um, uh, countries or areas you want to you wanna approach to. And make sure that you also have different rollouts and take good care about um, about the copyright, the text, how things are called, as there are some, um, there was some cars that he had a wrong name, not from BMW, but a wrong name that enticed something else, uh, undesired on different countries, and that's why they had to change their names. And so think about it and test, 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 have specialists from those, from those countries. That's a good point. And nowadays, I guess you can do quite a lot also with online research. So you can really capture much more also of the local markets without like, I mean, it's the best, of course, going to places and really doing like thorough like testing and research and, and working with the people with places. But I guess also like there are quite a lot of remote methods that you can use also on a regular basis. Yeah, especially have it ongoing, not as something exclusive, you know, like as the trips to the places, but you can really do quite a lot as well. I think especially with Corona right now, right, where we're not able to leave our house, so everyone is in my uh, in my uh, living room, and I think it's it's great to understand that using those digital tools to to have access to your customers and still because we still need to innovate, we still need to bring products to the market and hit our targets, and it depends on us. And it was a great exercise to to talk also with Anna in other talks of, oh my God, what's going on in the world right now? Uh, are people, can, how can we test this stuff? How can uh, we, we make sure that we're, we're driving that innovation even on a time where no one is driving, everyone is home? True. All right, so I see like there were also some questions that we're going to share the link. Yes, the webinar is being recorded and we will share it. Uh, it will be uploaded on YouTube. So Hive has a channel and uh, there will be the link so that we can share as well as, as the follow up so that you will be also able to share with other people all, uh, or watch it if also some people maybe um, had to already leave or yeah, would like to watch it again. And um, yeah, I guess then um, 
we conclude our discussion <laughs> for today. I could keep talking to you, Bruno, still for another couple of hours. It's always the time flies so fast. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone who joined us today. It was uh, really, really insightful. Bruno, thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, as always, it was really great talking to you and um, I'm super happy that we did it also to share your knowledge with the, with the community of people who came and were interested in listening to us. Thank you so much, Anna, for, for the opportunity to, to tell my story a little bit here, as well as uh, having this communication channel open. So everyone that is here, feel free to add me, uh, uh, go ahead on follow me on LinkedIn. And I feel that it's, this is just my point of view. You might, someone might have something different. And I think that conversation is great. If it sparks a conversation, just get in touch. It would be great to continue this somewhere else. And maybe even in a couple of years down the road to take a look back and say, well, hmm, did something change or not? As we're experiencing so much fast changes in our field, it's great to maybe go ahead back and say like, mm, remember that time I said that? Well, mm, I don't believe it's true anymore. Absolutely. So let's keep discussion going and we stay in touch. Uh, and also to all our guests, uh, let's stay in touch with us. You will also uh, see the, our emails and links to our LinkedIn profiles and the follow-up email if you are, would like to get in touch later on. Okay, so thanks a lot and bye-bye everyone. That was the end of our webinar. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.